Yesterday it was quarterbacks. Today we're looking at the rookie wide receivers. There is a lot to be excited about. You know, you had some. We've had some really good wide receiver classes in the past. I think everything gets measured up against 2014. Watkins, Evans, Beckham, Brandon Cooks, Kelvin Benjamin in the first round. Later we had Jordan Matthews, Devonte Adams, Allen Robinson, Jarvis Landry among the second rounders. That was amazing. Let's go back to 2021. Jamar Chase, Jalen Waddle, Devonte Smith. I'm going to stop right there. I'm going to bring in. Chris Trapasso, who is one of our NFL draft experts, been breaking down the film for a long time now, knows these prospects. Jamar Chase, Jalen Waddle, Devontae Smith. How does that big three compare to, and, and spoiler alert, these are not the top three in Chris's rankings, but the I would say consensus top three of Harrison, uh, Neighbors, Odunze. How would you compare 2021 Chase, Waddle, Smith to these three? It's very comparable. I think the biggest difference would be that this big three uh, are just bigger wide receivers. I mean, Jamar Chase is that stocky kind of Debo Samuel frame, but Waddle was a smaller wide receiver. Obviously, Devontae Smith, the Slim Reaper, was just ridiculously small, but has been able to be a pretty good wide receiver too there in Philadelphia, like one of the best in the league. With Harrison Jr., even neighbors, six foot, 200, and then Odunze and Brian Thomas. I kind of call it a big four, all bigger bodied wide receivers as we've seen lightness at the receiver spot kind of become the trend over the last couple of years. And welcome, Chris. That was, uh, you know, just throwing you right into the fire. How you doing? Doing pretty good. It's a busy time. I'm trying to watch as many final like seventh round or priority free agent prospects now in between writing for CBS and doing appearances like this one. So it's definitely a fun time. Uh, Jamie's here. Hey, Jamie. Hey, boys. Dave's here. Hey, Dave. Boys, boys. You know, one thing I noticed, guys, is going back and looking at these classes. So, again, you had Chase, Waddle, Smith. You had Kadarius, Tony, and Rashad Bateman. In the second round in 2021, you had Elijah Moore, Rondell Moore, Dwayne Eskridge, Tutu Atwell, and Terrace Marshall. Ah! Thanks. 2022. 2022 wasn't bad. You had six wide receivers, uh, five wide receivers in the top 18. London, Garrett Wilson, Olave, Jamison Williams, Dotson, Burks. Okay, six. Second round, you had Christian Watson, Wandale Robinson, Mechie, Tyquan Thornton, George Pickens, Alec Pierce, Sky Moore. Um, even that 2014 class, look at the second round. Marquise Lee, Jordan Matthews, Paul Richardson, Devontae Adams, Cody Lattimore, Allen Robinson, Jarvis Landry. That was a good second round. I've noticed second round wide receivers are usually not good for fantasy in spectacular ways. NFL. What's that? Or the NFL. <laughs> right, right. But but I know coming out of the draft, Jamie, I know we're going to be excited about a lot of second-round wide receivers, if not all of them coming out of the draft. So talk yeah, about not me, that. No, I'm going straight to the third round for Tank Dell and the fifth round and the seventh, uh, fifth round for uh, Puka Nakua. Puka, yeah. um, th those are the only guys I, I'm looking for. Third round, fifth round, second round, forget it. Just, you know, ignore those guys completely. <laughs> um, you're looking for, you know, just because they're, they're always going to pop up like that. Uh, but no, I, I think you you're hoping that the class is so deep that you know the the fit is right you know that's always my my biggest thing this this time of year i mean you know to talk about the draft prospects is clearly exciting but clearly the fit is is what matters the most you know where these guys end up and the systems that they're in the quarterbacks that they're playing with the offensive coordinators that are going to use them and and the talent around them i mean you know go back to last year for example you know we're going to talk about this a lot you know throughout the course of this year as well jackson smith and the jigba was regarded as you know one of the best, if not the best receivers. And he ended up in a horrible situation for fantasy because of the two guys that are in front of him on the depth chart. So, you know, teams are going to do their due diligence to add a receiver. I, I saw somebody tweet the other day that if you don't come out of this draft with a offensive lineman or a wide receiver, you didn't do the right thing because there's so much talent at those positions. And clearly that's not realistic for every team, but you know, when you're trying to stockpile talent, those are two positions that have a lot of talent in this class. And so the, the second round, the third round, we're going to see a lot of teams, you know, still load up, even though they may not have a necessarily a need right away. Uh, but yes, um, the, the second round receivers lately have just been absolutely dreadful. So hopefully it's not the case in 2023, 2024, excuse me. Chris, how many wide receivers should go in the first round? How many will go in the first round? I think five or six should probably go. And that feels like what it will ultimately be. We'll have the big three or big four. Um, and then Xavier Worthy, I think just with 4 2 1 speed, we have seen obviously John Ross was a top 10 pick, Henry Ruggs went ahead of Jerry Judy and CD Lamb uh, in 2020. So I think uh, Xavier Worthy probably deserves it just because he has that speed. And I think he plays 
a little bigger than his really spindly frame. And I think either one of Lad McConkey or A.D. Mitchell um, from Georgia and Texas, respectively, are capable of being first-round picks and being those future number one wide receivers. So, like you mentioned, we had two years ago six wide receivers in the first round. I won't be shocked if we see that again. And I really feel like that's what is deserving from this wide receiver class. The over-under is six and a half receivers in the first oh. round. It sounds like you're on the under there. Chris. Yeah, I, unless there's a name I'm totally forgetting. Well, I guess Worthy. No, I, I don't think Worthy. Yeah, so it, it feels like six is what I would ultimately bet on. So I would go under there. I would too. We talked about that on our player prop show on YouTube, Adam. Oh, okay. Uh, we can promote that in a little bit. You know, I'm not afraid to embarrass myself on the air. So huh. I'm just going to say, I'm just going to let everyone laugh at me now. I don't think I've ever said the word out loud, but I've read it so many times when you read NFL draft uh, uh, scouting reports. I always just thought it was spindly. Uh, but it's spindly, it's apparently. Spindly. I write spindly all the time. That's why I think it just came out. It, it's just because I've written skinny so many times that I had to think of a different word because <laughs> yeah. it was getting redundant in my own scouting reports. So I've, I've actually kind of flipped it this year. I I think I write spindly every single time there's a Nate Wiggins or there's a Lad McConkey or someone that's not really that thick. Um, and So, yeah, it's I'm pretty sure it's spindly. Yeah, well, I, well, no, I think I think you're right. I just googled it, but I thought you know, <laughs> I thought like a spine, like you know, wasn't okay. that Adam on your dating profile before you got married? <laughs> <laughs> right, but it was written, it was never pronounced. Xavier Worthy, by the way, look at these numbers. Xavier Worthy, seventy-five catches, one thousand fourteen yards, five touchdowns. John Ross in his last year at Washington, 81 catches, 1,150 yards. He did have 17 touchdowns though, but I did, mm. I did notice that their numbers, catches and yards were, were pretty similar. And uh, the speed, I mean, John Ross was, was a pretty big bust top 10 pick, uh, but the speed Xavier worthy, just, just unbelievable. That's what Ross was hopefully worthy. Oh, uh, we'll have a better fantasy impact. All right. Um, we have a lot to get to. I just want to promote CBS Sports HQ because right now is the time. NBA playoffs, NHL playoffs, they're about to start. NFL draft coverage is going to be unbelievable on CBS Sports HQ. So check it out. All of your sports needs, it's 24-7, and it'll keep you up to date on everything you need to know with great interviews, great guests, uh, terrific analysts on there. CBS Sports HQ, uh, I watch it on the CBS Sports app. And you will love it. Also, congratulations to CC Barth, winner of our bracket challenge. CC had UConn over Purdue. Way to go. You are in the podcast league. Here's what we're going to talk about today. I'm going to ask Chris why he has Brian Thomas in. The, he's been calling it the big four. So he mm -hmm. has Brian Thomas as part of that big four. Uh, he also has. Malik how would you how would you read his rankings? Like number and name. What do you mean? Well, just read the list, like the top four. Read, how would you number them and, and read read them? Well, his rankings are one, Malik Neighbors, mm -hmm. two, Marvin Harrison Jr., mm -hmm. three, Brian Thomas. Is it Thomas? Did I get that right? <laughs> and four, Romo Dunze. So you, you can count one through four. <laughs> I don't know where we're going here. What do you mean? From the emails that you sent earlier where you went, whoa, Brian Thomas is his number four. Like, and I bet Brian Thomas is his number four. Yes, it's number three. Yes. Uh, Lad McConkey five, Xavier Worthy six, Adonai Mitchell seven, Javon Baker or Javon Baker eight, Troy Franklin nine, Malik Washington out of Virginia is ten. So that it's a pretty interesting list, and uh, you're gonna just you're gonna see a lot of differences probably for most people after the big three. Uh, mm -hmm. But a couple news items real quick. Rasheed Rice is facing eight charges in connection to that multi car accident. Is obviously something we're gonna have to be keeping an eye on. And Cleveland reworked Nick Chubb's contract, lowering his salary cap hit almost $10 million, giving him more incentives this year. So that'll keep him on the roster, but give him some incentives to earn Nick Chubb. Uh, as it relates to Rasheed Rice, Chris, let me ask you this. If, is there a wide receiver that the Chiefs could take at the end of round one that you would say, okay, maybe not this year, but overall, he's got a better outlook than Rasheed Rice? I like... Adonai Mitchell, Xavier Worthy, whatever, better than Rasheed Rice now. What, what do you think about that? Because it's possible that they take a receiver at the end of round one. Yeah, it would probably be Adonai Mitchell uh, just because I think the book on him, I'm kind of in the consensus, is that in time he could be one of like the top 10 receivers in the league because he's big, 6'2", over 200 pounds, 
434 speed, the 40 inch vertical, it's all there. And then the fluidity running route, I think is really, it's different from Rasheed Rice or really anyone else on that Chiefs roster. And although they have kind of leaned into yards after the catch, they're one of the best yards after the catch teams really in the entire Patrick Mahomes and Andy Reid era. And that's not really where Mitchell wins. It kind of feels like to have a bigger body who can get open uh, with pretty good regularity is something that this offense, even after signing Marquise Brown, is kind of still missing. So if Mitchell land in Kansas City, I would like him maybe not to be a huge fantasy contributor, to, to, to be someone that you would pick early in drafts. But in 2025 and beyond, I think he could really kind of round into form as a true wide receiver one in that offense. You brought oh, yes. this up the other day, Adam, about um... – whoever ends in Buffalo, right? And how excited we'll be, let's say, over somebody who ends up in, you know, the... the Chicago? Sure, Chicago. Um, you know, if you wanted to... Uh, whatever. And one Or the top three. I think the question was you posed to Heath. You know, somebody ends up in Buffalo versus one of the top three or four guys ends up in, you know, crowded situation. Uh, this will be a similar scenario, even with a crowded That's receiving core for the Chiefs. Yeah. All right, sorry to interrupt you. I do have to take a quick break. We'll come back and uh, we'll get into... A lot more right after this. Every spring, we marvel at its majesty. A tradition unlike any other. The Masters. This weekend on CBS and streaming on Paramount+. Plus. Chris, take us through your process. What do you look for in these wide receivers? And how should we be evaluating them? And what's going to stick in the NFL? Well, sure. I think everyone today knows how important separation ability is. And what I wish is that we had some way to quantify that. Like the, the PFF data is so uh, widespread now for college, but there's not really a stat that says like how, like how often they got open and obviously guys can get schemed open. So it's kind of tricky. So you just like to watch for that on film. And like I mentioned earlier, uh, I, I am a huge advocate of yards after the catch. And that's just from watching the chiefs beat the bills a lot. Uh, in the playoffs and the 49ers be so good and so consistent, regardless of who the quarterback is um, over the last five to seven years they are so good after the catch. So for me, it's separation ability. And I probably place more of an emphasis on yards after the catch than most analysts. I mean, certainly different roles like Adonai Mitchell was really used down the field. Devontae Walker, same thing at North Carolina. But to me, when I think of the best receivers in the NFL, yeah, they run great routes. They can beat press at the line but there have kind of become the best after the catch with the Debo Samuel, Stephon Diggs, um, Jamar Chase, Justin Jefferson's very good after the catch. So I try to find those players that maybe if they even consensus wise are kind of viewed not as highly, if they're good after the catch, I think with how much schemed open production there is in today's NFL, then those will ultimately be higher uh, graded prospects for me. So is that season. why you're uh, you're on Javon Walker as much as you are? Twenty one point nine yards after catch. Yes, that that that's uh, Baker. You mean right? UCF. Yes, Javon yeah. Baker. Yeah, Baker. Baker. Yeah, sorry, I was getting Javon Baker, Devontae Walker, kind of yeah, mixed sorry. up there. Yeah, no, I, I I mean that's why I'm a big fan of his because I think after the catch, uh, at six one, almost two hundred and ten pounds, he's really good in that regard, and I think he does everything else pretty well too. Just ran slowly four five four. So maybe that does push him into that vaunted second round that that we want to try to stay away from, um, or maybe even later into the third round, and he could be that tank Dell of this year's draft class. But being able to just have contact balance, cutting ability, create those you know RPO slants to go from a five yard pass to a twenty yard gain, I think is absolutely vital at the receiver spot today. Showed my age there a little bit with Javon Walker. Yes, that the <laughs> last wide receiver that the Packers drafted in the first round, yeah. two thousand and two. Um, I'll take it. He had a a nice career though. Um, yes. Who gets open? That's what I, that's what I struggle with when I watch these guys. Like I, I watch Troy Franklin, right? Like I know he can run by guys. Um, but can he run like a seven yard slant and create separation? I, I, I don't know. So who, who gets open in this class that in a way that excites you? Yeah, there's two wide receivers, Lad McConkey and Ricky Pearsall in terms of they blend athleticism, like high caliber athleticism. Land McConkey ran 439, 39 inch vertical. Ricky Pearsall had over a 40 inch vertical. So you know the explosion off the line and at the top of that route stem are certainly there with both of those players. And then they blend that with the what I like to call route salesmanship that shoulder fakes, head fakes, changing speeds, hitting double moves. Uh, they do such a good job 
really selling the route by kind of pretending they're going to go in the other direction first. And they did that in the SEC over a long period. So those two, I mean, outside of obviously like Marvin Harrison Jr. can certainly get open, Malik Neighbors as well. But like those late first round into the second round wide receivers that really stood out just in terms of getting open against man-to-man coverage where it's not gimmicky, it's not the Oregon offense. Led McConkey, Ricky Pierce all really stood out for me. Dave, you haven't spoken in a while. Talk about some receivers. Well, first of all, I, I love what Chris had to say about what he looks for on film, and there's something that we can learn from that. I wanted to add that I think it's almost as important to learn how receivers get open mm-hmm. because not every receiver gets open every way possible. I mean, I guess it depends on who they're playing against, but some receivers like McConkey. He gets open because of his footwork, his technique, the the route salesmanship that Chris talked about. Like that's his best strength. And then you've got other receivers that can do everything. Like I think Odunze is one of those guys that can get open any way you want. Harrison obviously can. Neighbors has the speed. Does he have the footwork to match it? I don't know if it's I as am. good as as Harrison and Odunze's, but it could get there. And so that's part of it for me. And then the other part of it is projection. What is it that these receivers did in college that their new teams will like? This goes hand in hand with what Jamie was saying. This is why everything that we're talking about now is kind of incomplete. We need to see where these guys are going to play because teams will see the things that they love about these players and then use it in their offense. Here are the reasons why uh, Arizona loves Marvin Harrison. It's this, this, and this, and here's how it's going to fit into the offense. That's for us to do for fantasy. That's for analysts to do after the draft. That's for fantasy managers to learn from to either like or dislike a player once the draft is over and how they'll fit into that offense. But we can kind of get ideas on how they might fit along the way. Um, I, I think the big three is on a totally different level than everybody else in the class. And I don't know if there's a, 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 a solid consensus after those first three guys. Mm-hmm. No offense to Chris and having him having no, him in that fourth and in his, in his third spot. So he's got a top four. I've seen Thomas rank that high from other people. I've seen Thomas way down low because one of the things he can't do is, I, I, or he hasn't shown a lot of, is getting open with good footwork and, and good route salesmanship and route variation. He's got speed, he's got height, but there's things that are missing from his game for now. But if there's projection, and I'm sure the team that drafts him will say that, he'll eventually become one of the better all around receivers once he learns how to do the things that other receivers are better at than one right now. All right, so I actually don't really want to talk too much about Neighbors, Harrison, and Odunze today because I, if we can establish this, I mean, does everyone just think those three guys are studs and obviously we have to wait to see where they go, but, you know, should be very high picks in dynasty leagues and have the chance to be high picks in redraft leagues? Like, we don't have to. I, I guess I kind of want to uncover some some gems, and and I just feel like our audience knows Harrison neighbors are doing. Say Harrison neighbors are doing. You've heard it. You know it. These guys are really good. I want to spend time on other guys. Are we are we cool with that? Does everybody have yeah. like no beef with them? Mm-mm. All good. All right. Yeah. Um, you do have. I'll let you just say you you do have neighbors first, Jamie. Who's your favorite right now? Chris has neighbors first. Who's your favorite, Jamie? And. Uh, go ahead, Jamie. Yeah. No, Harrison. I mean, but uh, you know, I, I I see the case for neighbors. You know, I I think um, you know it's going to be a, a situation where whatever team feels that particular receiver is the better fit might make the call one over the other. You know, it just feels as if Harrison. We've been talking about him for a couple of years now, and he's done nothing. I think aside from you know not testing to uh, you know put any anything in doubt. Not that the testing really matters to 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 solidify his draft stock, but. I mean, it's one and one A. You know, they're they're both special mm-hmm. talents and both can have the ability, hopefully, to uh, you know be long contributors in the NFL and for fantasy managers for many many years. Is it one C? Is Odunze one C? Yeah, he's third, but you know, I I think he's behind those two guys. You know, just given the fact of uh, what those other two project to be, you know, slightly a little bit better and have a little bit higher ceiling, in my opinion. But yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, th- those are the three I think that we'll see go hopefully in the top ten because I think they have the ability to uh, you know sort of flip the script about what uh what they can bring to an offense and, and and hopefully you know be dynamic playmakers for many many years chris you want to give your thoughts on those three then we'll obviously we'll let's talk about brian thomas so you include it as a big four but just those three 
Yeah, so I think it's probably good for me to talk why I have Neighbors ahead of Odunze, and it's kind of going off what Dave said. Uh, Malik Neighbors didn't run the full route tree, and I think that is actually Marvin Harrison Jr. at his size, like one of the biggest strengths of his game. That at Ohio State, we know how well coached they are. They come into the league, all those receivers from that program, very well versed getting off the line, releases, running intricate routes. Neighbors didn't really have to do that, and I think he has the athleticism to ultimately do that. But I actually have him higher than Marvin Harrison Jr. Because like I mentioned before, sounded like a broken record here. Yards after the catch, I think is through the roof. I think watching those two, and I did it back to back in early January, Neighbors just was way more dynamic with the football in his hands. That's instantly hitting the accelerators. That's bouncing off tackles. Um, He is just better in that regard right now than Marvin Harrison Jr. That's not to say that in a slightly different role that maybe accentuates space and yards after the catch. That really wasn't the case at Ohio state that maybe Marvin Harrison jr. Can be really good after the catch, but just what I saw now, I think Marvin Harrison jr. Is just a little bit behind Malik neighbors in that regard. And I like Odunze. It's not like I have him, you know, as a second round pick, I have him just a few spots behind Brian Thomas. And it's kind of for the same reason that I don't think he's as good after the catch um, and has quite the athletic profile of a Brian Thomas jr. Who, is kind of a moldable ball of clay and was really productive in his final season alongside Malik Neighbors at LSU. So you're on know, the that... LSU payroll. Got it. <laughs> yes. I don't know if I've ever seen anyone explode like Malik Neighbors. It's it's unbelievable. It's insane. It is. Um, but I did notice just just anybody just go watch his highlights, and one thing you'll notice is that almost all of his big plays, it seems to me anyway, and I think all but two of his touchdowns came from the slot. So can he be an outside receiver or is he a slot guy? I mean, it's weird. It'd be weird to take a, a slot receiver sixth overall or something like that. But what do you think, Chris? Can Malik neighbors be an outside guy? I think so. I think he has the explosion to just burn past bigger, larger corners. Um, you probably can get better matchups inside and there's just more space where he's really a nightmare, but I didn't see anything on film that suggests that he doesn't have the wiggle or just the acceleration off the ball to not be able to win on the outside in the NFL or the physicality. Yeah, exactly. Physical. So he can, he can work anywhere. Do you guys think that Roma Dunze is a better prospect than Garrett Wilson? No, off the top of my head. No, no, No. I don't. Okay. Okay. All right. Let's get to the next group then. And I'm going to say, why don't we go to the big guys? Uh, you know what? Uh, let's let's just let you talk about Brian Thomas. All right. Okay. So he's uh, he's young. He'll be 22 years old in October. He's 6'4", 205 pounds. Brian Thomas out of LSU ran a 4'3", 40. He led the, tu- the country in touchdown catches with 17. Um, he did not have a 400-yard season before last year. And, and that's actually something you're going to find from a number of these top prospects like a Xavier Leggett and Brian Thomas and uh, – the names elude me right now, but there are a lot of them that, that didn't really do much until this past year. Um, and like a guy like Lad McConkey, he didn't really have big numbers his entire career. So uh, you might have to put that uh, in the back of your mind. But what is it that that you like about Thomas and what could go wrong with Brian Thomas? Well, I can start by saying that it's a very similar case. And maybe it was just the offense that uh, he and Malik Neighbors the route tree stuff that you see with Marvin Harrison Jr., you see with Ricky Pearsall at Florida and certainly Lad McConkey at Georgia, it wasn't really there. It was run go routes, run post routes, we'll get you on an RPO slant over the middle, and then just do your thing. And so there will be like what could go wrong or, or there will be detractors that don't love that he's not super refined as a route runner. But I do like to your point, Adam, that he wasn't super productive until his final season. I like that that final season didn't come at 24 or 25 years old. And there are some older prospects in this class. He's still relatively young. So he was breaking out at a relatively early age. And that is a pretty good indicator of future success in the NFL. And then I think with the football in his hands, with that makeup being 6'4", 210 with four, low 4'3 four, speed, he can also hit the accelerators in a hurry, bounce off some tacklers because he's a bigger body. Um, I didn't see that quite the same with Roma Dunze, but again, used in different ways. I think Roma Dunze was used a lot how Marvin Harrison was um, at Ohio State. On the boundary, just throw him deep balls, let him track it amazingly. So maybe in different offenses with different roles, I would maybe 
lean toward Odunze and Harrison Jr. more, but as a big yards after the catch guy, I think that's why it kind of feels like I'm on the LSU payroll this season, hmm. loving neighbors and Brian Thomas a little bit more. Look at those two Gators there. Right, uh, right, Al Anthony Reed and Reed Anthony and uh, Chris Doring. Yeah, I don't remember, guys. I don't even remember him. You're, you're old. I man. remember Doring. <laughs> He's on the SEC Network now, isn't he? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I I want to bring this up as I you know I've been listening a lot to the Dynasty podcast, the FFT Dynasty podcast, which has been a great resource in getting ready for this show today. Um, some of the things that have been brought up, uh, you know, the way the NFL defenses are playing right now taking away the deep ball. I don't want to invest an early dynasty pick or a fantasy pick on a guy who's just a deep threat. And that's my concern for Brian Thomas now. And, and that he's not the only one. Uh, we need, uh, we need versatile guys because I don't want Marvin Mims basically or whatever. So, so are you concerned about that with Brian Thomas? You know, my, concern watching him and which by the way just for all of you who know like my thoughts on a player are probably going to be pretty low on the totem pole in terms of what i use i'm going to rely on the people who are really good at breaking down film and the nfl people who are drafting these guys but i look at him i go all right he can be i know he can beat you deep and i know he can run away from you and 12 of his 17 touchdowns were deep balls on either go mostly go routes and post routes can brian thomas do anything else that is my big concern chris uh, I think he can, and I, I don't have the number in front of me right now, but I know his career missed tackle four straight was over 20%, and that's a pretty big number. I mean, Malik Neighbors was like 31%, which is like astronomical. Um, Roma Dunze was like in the 14 or 15%. So uh, I, I think he can take that slant or that dig route or a comeback and make a big play out of it. Now, that is probably his specialty, getting down the football field, but I think with like Devontae Walker, who I mentioned earlier, Brendan Rice, who we can get to from UC, uh, from USC, they are more down the field only type players that aren't the greatest athletes and aren't going to provide that kind of low contact or that low center of gravity and the contact balance that I think we've come to realize you need to be a really good yards after the catch type player. Now, again, is Brian Thomas going to run the most intricate route and just get open like Tank Dell did last season? Probably not. And, and he may never be that type of separator. I don't think... A, Odunze will either, but I do think that Brian Thomas can give you again with how much schemed open production there is at the wide receiver spot. And like you're saying, Adam, that safeties they're too deep and they're just trying to limit those explosive plays over their heads. You need to be good after the catch. And I think again, Brian Thomas, what he showed in 2023 proves that he probably will be able to be similarly effective in the NFL in that regard. Dave, Jamie, anything you guys want to add on Brian Thomas? Yeah, uh, I'm not as big of a fan. Uh, there are some stats that match what I saw in film with Brian Thomas that kind of speaks to what you were talking about, Adam, about how he's just a great deep speed guy. And it doesn't mean that he can't change who he is once he gets into the NFL. This is just what I saw in film marrying up with some stats. Uh, he had almost 1,200 receiving yards last year. Just 162 of them came after first contact, and 50 of those all came on one play against Florida State. On throws of five or fewer air yards, these are short throws close to the line of scrimmage, caught 95% of them. That's awesome. 270 yards, two touchdowns, 4.5 yards after catch per reception, 5.3% uh, explosive play rate. That tells me that he's not making those huge plays after the catch. On throws of six to 14 air yards, Thomas caught nine of 16 targets. Uh, yards after catch per reception was even worse. It was 2.8 yards. And then in the red zone, uh, eight of 11 targets caught, six touchdowns of the six scores. Five came from the seven-yard line or farther out. So I, I worry a little bit about what he can do. Maybe right away I worry about this more so than like two, three years down the line as far as short area target and making defenses pay for um, you know playing that soft off coverage against him. Can he take a screen and go 25 yards? Can he break a tackle and make a big gain after that? These are things that I wish I saw more of on film from Brian Thomas and makes me a little bit nervous to say, yeah, he's as complete of a, of a receiver as other guys in this draft. Mm -hmm. He comes from the right school, though. He does. And I think basically to sum up what you probably just heard, I think he's going to be more attractive in Dynasty than he is in Redraft. And he's a little mm -hmm. bit of a project. And based on what he's able to do right now, 
no, he's not there. It's going to be the projection because he is younger than a lot of the other guys that we're going to be talking about. So that's kind of the scheme. This is also like a, a Jacksonville candidate, you know, mid first round pick. Buffalo. Buffalo candidate, you know, for a trade up type right. situation unless he falls, <laughs> you know. So that may accelerate the the process for where fantasy managers view him. You know, if he goes to one of these situations where there's an opening right away for targets, you know, so if he goes to a situation where he's buried a little bit, you know, then you're talking more dynasty than redraft, but this is going to be one of these guys that we look at and say, does he, does he make it to Buffalo? Does he, you know, does Jacksonville jump in at what are they 16 or 17 They're um, 17, I think. to, to, you know, add to their receiving core, you know, or, or a surprise team that goes and gets him because they feel like, if not right away, uh, maybe by the second half of the season, Kansas City, for example, like what they did with Rice, you know, you get that type of production. So it could it could change. Mm-hmm. Chris, I know you're in Buffalo. You pay attention yep. to the Bills quite a bit. Have yep. you thought about how Brian Thomas would play in that offense if he went there? Well, I think like you guys are saying, there is like 240-something available targets from last year's wide receiver group and what the Josh Allen, Sean McDermott, even Brandon Bean said after they lost to the chiefs in the divisional round was we need more explosive plays. Like the chiefs had eight explosive plays in that game. The bills had zero. Uh, and that's really something that since the the high watermark to date for Josh Allen in 2020, the percentage of downfield throws, the completion percentage on 20 uh, or more air yard throws for Josh Allen has all kind of dwindled the last few years. I really think they do want, that down the field element to their offense that they really didn't have the last few years. And it feels like with Josh Allen's arm strength and just how well that offense operates under him, that he, that I think someone like a Brian Thomas would be good in this offense, especially after they signed Curtis Samuel and they saw Khalil Shakir kind of take that step as that chain moving slot receiver last year. All right. So other wide receivers who could go in the first round, just going to throw a bunch of names out. Xavier worthy, you know, obviously Brian Thomas and the, and the other three, Xavier Leggett, Adonai Mitchell, Troy Franklin, Keon Coleman. Then you have slot guys, Lab McConkey, uh, Ricky Pierce, all probably not Roman Wilson, probably not. But um, who do you think if we're looking at Jacksonville, if we're looking at Buffalo, at teams that need a number one outside receiver per se, um, that could be really appealing as a rookie in fantasy. I, I don't think I said the, Xavier Leggett's name. Uh, yes, I did. Uh, who's the guy that could step in and be ready in 2024, Chris, in your opinion? It could be Thomas to have that big impact. That's a tough question because that's kind of like, I think it's Lad McConkie, which I don't, I don't want to just only talk about him. It just in terms of what, what Dave was saying earlier, just being able to win with footwork and fluidity. And I think he's a good enough athlete to be that guy where he's maybe not going to have a thousand yard rookie season, but there's a relatively high floor. I think with Leggett, he's weirdly like kind of a gadget type player at 6'1, 220. He has 439 speed, had the one huge breakout season after having like 400 yards in his first three years at South Carolina. Um, so, I, and I didn't see him getting open a ton. I think he was schemed open and was found by Spencer Rattler relatively often in that South Carolina offense. Um, Xavier Worthy, I think, can be kind of a niche guy that can just get down the field and, and and make some big splash plays for you. I don't know if he's going to be high volume right away. Um, and Ricky Pearsall, like I said earlier, he, he can get open. I don't see much yards after the catchability to his game. Um, so it, it's kind of like, I, I love the depth of this class, but I think there's more niche players than, you know, a Terry McLaurin in the third round that could really do it all speed routes, hands, everything um, beyond like the big four or five, uh, top wide receivers in this class. And that's going to lead me to my next question, which we'll get to right after this break. And I'm going to ask Chris and Dave and Jamie, if this draft class is overrated, we'll be right back on FFT. I am a prisoner of this hotel. Why do they let you live? You must never leave. They can take away everything. They can't take away who you are. So Chris was saying, you know, he sees a lot of niche players, niche players. You can say it however you want, spindly, spindly um, in this class. So, yeah, is it, is it a little overrated in terms of uh, consistent contributors and maybe even like top 24 fantasy guys? What do you think, Chris? 
Well, you guys can more speak to the fantasy contributions, but I think just from a scouting perspective, it is a little bit overrated. And I think it's because it is so buoyed by Marvin Harrison Jr., the name recognition. And just like Jamie said that he was on the radar from when he was like a freshman playing with like Chris Olave and Garrett Wilson. It's like, oh, this guy's going to be awesome when he's draft eligible. Malik Neighbors at LSU. Odunze was so good two years ago, played in the national title game. I think because of that, and then Brian Thomas is also in the mix, and there's Lad McConkey. Beyond that, I, I don't think that it's quite as good as like 2014, 2020 is another good class. Um, it, it's a, at this point, and and I've watched like 30 plus wide receivers. I think it is a little bit overrated in terms of the depth. Like there's again good slot guys, good down the field guys, but the complete players that you can sometimes find a Puka Nakua, a Tank Dell later. I don't see a bunch of those in this draft class. All right, how about we break down the prospects? Xavier Worthy and Troy Franklin are two really fast guys, skinny, spindly guys. I'm just going to wear that word out. <laughs> um, yeah, what do you think about them? Are, 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 yeah, go ahead. The floor is yeah. yours, and then I'll open it up to Jamie and Dave. Sure, thanks. Uh, Xavier Worthy, obviously, we talked about him before with his speed. I don't think he's like someone that is going to be relied upon to be a, a yards after the catch contact balance type player. But I like that at that spindly size with that spindly frame, that he's not someone who instantly goes down on first contact all the time. You watch the Alabama game. There's two or three plays. Um, one of which he gets a first down after like absorbing contact stayed on his feet. And at 170 pounds, you just don't see that very often. So I think he does give you a good blend of the speed, the yards after the catchability. Um, and Troy Franklin's story is interesting that 6'2", under 180 pounds, looks really fast in that kind of wide open offense at Oregon in the Pac-12 where no one really wanted to play defense or really have ever played defense. And then he runs 4-4-1 at the combine and everyone's like, man, he is so slow because you have Brian Thomas running 4-3-3 and A.D. Mitchell running 4-3-4, Devontae Walker 4-3-6. 441 is still pretty fast, especially for someone who looks very fast on film. He kind of feels like underrated at, at this point. I don't think he's going to be a first round pick, maybe early second. Uh, pretty good flexibility to get open at the intermediate level. Um, some yards after the catch skill, he tracks it well. I, I think of all of like the top 10 receivers that we probably heard about a lot, Troy Franklin right now feels like the most underrated to me. Chris, do you have an opinion on which of those two receivers could be Better, which one is better on shorter routes, maybe shorter in breaking routes specifically? I think Troy Franklin and and he ran a lot of those digs, the 10 to 15 yard dig. I, I mean, that's kind of getting to the intermediate level. Uh, worthy it is at his size, you would just look at it on paper and think, oh, he must be super quick. And like, again, I'm just going to use like a name that's fresh in my mind that, you know, Tank Dell quick. He's not really that type of player. Um, lateral quickness is not really his thing. Linear explosion certainly is, and long speed, as we know, with that 40-yard dash. But I think Troy Franklin, bendy, he's flexible. And I and I kind of thought the same about Puka Nakua last year, that at a bigger size, um, not sudden, but really just kind of a free-flowing type of player. That's kind of more of the vibe that I get with Troy Franklin underneath and then at that intermediate level that we know is so important. Is anybody better than... Worthy after the catch, other than neighbors, in terms of just speed. So for me, I mean, he, I, I felt like I was watching Tyreek Hill. Yeah. So I mean, I guess you can categorize yards after the catch two ways. You can say speed or just being able to absorb contact. I always lean into the guys that that are like Debo Samuel, and I think for the longest time, and I'll use a bill, a old school Bills reference. Roscoe Parrish was like the quickest dude out there but it was like oh it never really translated because you can be ultra quick but you're not going to be able to just juke out everyone like dante hall in the nfl so we've learned since like 2019 with debo and aj brown and and the year before that dj Moore, that you really have to be strong in your in your lower half and have that six foot 220 ish type of body uh frame to be awesome after the catch like a jamar chase um, and so I don't think Worthy is like someone who's going to make guys miss on a consistent basis. But if you give him any space at all, he and neighbors smash that acceleration button right away and can really like, I think, run away from anyone in the NFL. Going to be really curious to see where guy where he gets taken. He's he's such a 
scary prospect on both ends of the spectrum. Yes, like, he is. In the right system, he could be awesome. Like if Tyreek Hill went to a different team initially, is he Tyreek Hill? Mm. Like you'd like to think so, but John Ross was not that guy. Most of the speed guys are not that guy. You know, that that that's typically what we see is these guys that, you know, are so fast at the combine, they just don't doesn't translate. You know, Jacoby mm-hmm. Ford. Um, it just it, we don't see it because that's all they are. It's just fast, you know. And so yeah. I, I hope the right coach quarterback combo gets their hands on this kid and can make him into what he's potentially capable of being. But it's if not, and he's just, Hey, go run fast. <laughs> you know, it's it, like Chris said, it's not going to work. You know, I think a lot of people do think worthy is more than, than just speed. Yeah. And mm-hmm. you know, that's been encouraging to hear. And he's had a pretty productive career. 981 yards, 12 touchdowns, 760 yards, nine touchdowns, over a thousand yards, five touchdowns in three seasons. And, I've watched a lot of Texas pass plays uh, from 2023, and they did not have good quarterback play. I mean, Ooh. both Worthy and Mitchell should have had much better numbers, but I think Quinn Ewers it just is bad at throwing the deep ball. I mean, that's one thing. That's why Mitchell's numbers are really not that good. He's been open for big plays that all these other receivers that, that we've been watching are making, and they're just horrible throws. So keep that in mind for both of the Texas receivers. Um yeah. Yeah, yeah, just just very quickly on Worthy. He kind of gives me like a more refined version of Marquise Brown, who was like first round pick, picked in the late 20s, like pretty good player, you know, had some decent fantasy stretches, but that's kind of the same same size. I mean, Worthy in terms of time speed, I think it's faster, but he's not just fast. He's not just John Ross, but I don't know if his ceiling is like Tyreek Hill ask. So how about the big guys? I had Brian Thomas in here, but we've already discussed him. He's your number three guy. Uh, Xavier Leggett, one brilliant season, as Chris mentioned, one great season with South Carolina, but nothing really before that. Adonai Mitchell uh, and Keon Coleman out of Florida State. So how how do you feel about Leggett, Mitchell, and Coleman? And are they pretty much the same just in terms of overall rank as Worthy and Franklin? Well, what I'll say about Leggett that I've is this kind of counter to what I've said on, on like other appearances that he instantly got the Debo Samuel comparison. He's at South Carolina, similar body type. Uh, I, I, I don't think that's way far off. I mean, the missed tackle forced, he only forced nine missed tackles on 71 catches in this breakout season, which is not anywhere in the in the Debo Samuel realm from what he did at, at South Carolina. But running 439 with a 40 inch vertical, like that is some freaky explosiveness at six foot one, 220 pounds. So if you can tap into that and say, look, we're not going to ask you to run these intricate routes. We're not going to expect you to get open a ton at the intermediate level, but we're going to throw you those RPO slants. We're going to get you some bubble screen, some deep overs, and just let you hit those accelerators. I think Legat, maybe in the late first, if it's Buffalo, if it's Kansas city at 32, maybe even Baltimore dips back into the, the um, wide receiver. Well, then I could see that being a good landing spot for him. Keon Coleman is the one, and I'm interested in Dave's thoughts being a big Miami Hurricane guy. That I, I'm out on Keon Coleman. That I, I don't think at four six one, the explosion was there. I know early in the process, pre combine, it was like he was a trendy pick late in the first. I don't think he gets open. And the fact that if you're that big, and your game is predicated on a few highlight reel contested catches that you made. The rest of the season that has to continue, only 10 of 33 contested catch situations did he actually win and come down with the football. So he's not a 50-50 guy. He's a one-third of the time he comes down with the football in the ACC. Um, so Keon Coleman is someone I think should be like a third or fourth round pick. I, I just did not see it with him. The LSU game to start the season was awesome. After that, I saw someone that was kind of like a diminishing player down the stretch. You remember at the combine, he, he four six one in the forty. And then mm-hmm. when he ran his gauntlet drill, wasn't he like the fastest guy yes. in the drill? Or yeah, something? It's, it's, it's crazy yeah. how that all works out. Mm-hmm. So I, you go back and you watch him. No, he's not the fastest guy on the field, but he is a big dude. And FSU had two of those big dudes. And yeah. I remember watching them thinking, yeah, these guys are, are kind of great, but are, are they more like Chase Claypool or can they be mm-hmm. more like DK Metcalf or, or somebody of that ilk, somebody who's just big and can dominate? I wonder if he can learn that trait, but I, I – I think that a team will be enamored with the size and try and find a way to utilize that size in their offense without having to burn a big pick on Keon Coleman. 
Yeah, but I do like I do like the definitive take. I mean, that you're just out on him, and that's yeah, that's good to know. I'm not saying you're going to be right, but I I like that because we have to we have to form our opinions here and try to separate these guys. Coleman, by the way, this is a comparison you're going to hear. Not that they're the same player, but I think he had the slowest forty and the fastest gauntlet, or one of the slowest and and one of the fastest. And that's exactly what Puka Nakua had the year before. A bad mm, 40. Yeah. This gauntlet. So, you know, I think it was great that Nakua ended up with the Rams. They obviously know how to scheme their receivers. But but the gauntlet drill is pretty cool. I think it's a cool drill to watch. See these guys go across the field, catch these passes. And he did it really, really well. So that was surprising because uh, with the 4 6 one, 40 was it. But that's was, the difference between game speed and the 40. I mean, it's. I know, but I, I when would, you run the forty, you're not in pads. Yeah, and you, how often do you see guys running straight for forty yards? But when you on hands? Coleman, do you see game speed? Because I don't, I don't. I, Chris obviously doesn't see game speed when you see he's not. I don't think he plays fast. No, does he? right. I think you see his game speed, which isn't necessarily great. Yeah. Um. What about Leggett? I thought Leggett. I don't know how you feel about this. You talked about Coleman not making contested catches. You watch so much more tape than I do, but I saw a lot of contested catches. I thought Leggett was really good at that. Is is that something he's good at? Yeah, definitely. That's why I, I'm much higher on him than I am Keon Coleman. And like I said, late first, early second for a team would make a lot of sense to me. Uh, just and also kind of baking in where it feels like Leggett will get picked. Uh, I think he does track it well, and he does have that bigger frame, not quite as tall as Keon Coleman. But a lot of times, as we've seen over the years, that a lot of those contested catches, the back shoulder throws that are a pretty big part of the game when you have an elite level quarterback are all about body position and kind of boxing out as opposed to literally just leaping over a player like Roma Dunze does quite often, um, Mike Evans as well. Uh, so, yeah, I think that is a strength to his game that if you, you have a quarterback that's not going to be afraid to maybe throw it to Xavier Leggett when he's not wide open on the vertical route tree, he will... I think come down with those footballs more often than Keon Coleman would. What is the difference between Adonai Mitchell and Brian Thomas? Cause I think they both could be sort of presented as um great combination of size and speed, athletic freaks, uh, you, you know, um, kind of projects though, as we talked about with Thomas, mm -hmm. what separates Thomas from Mitchell? Yeah, they are pretty similar. I think the two biggest differences I mentioned earlier, I mean, Dave didn't quite see this and that's fine. I, I think Thomas is better after the catch, can bounce off guys, has that contact balance. And Adonai Mitchell, the route running smoothness, the flexibility, like the bend to take some physicality from a cornerback and still stay at the, almost the same speed, not get kind of thrown off his route at 6'2 and 210, I think is special. Like I talked to Greg Cosell at, uh, at the combine, was super awesome to kind of be able to talk to him about prospects. And he mentioned like the route running smoothness from Adonai Mitchell was as good as he's, as he's seen at someone that big in a while. And then we saw him at the combine run four, three, four. So I think that's the biggest difference that Brian Thomas is a little more jagged of an athlete. He's not quite as, as bendy and flexible as AD Mitchell from Texas. Yeah, we get to a really fun group now of I'm going to call them slot receivers, even though I was I watched Lad McConkey. He's outside a lot. But Ricky Pearsall out of Florida, Roman Wilson out of Michigan, Lad McConkey out of Georgia. And Jamie, there's been a lot of talk about Ricky Pearsall on the Dynasty podcast. I know Schneier likes him a lot. Jacob Gibbs, not so much. Thomas Schaefer actually built a, a shrine for Ricky Pearsall. He's a big fan. Uh, <laughs> compared him to Adam Thielen. Uh, but, you know. What do you think? What do you think about these slot guys, Pierre Saul, Wilson, and McConkey? I was excited until you said Dan liked him. Now I'm scared. Um, <laughs> I, I I think look for for Pierre Saul, he'll just continue the trend of um, you know underwhelming college career and becoming hopefully a good pro. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. Maybe maybe the reverse, you know, depending on or overdrafted uh, Kyle Pitts and Anthony Richardson so far. Uh, we'll see. Uh, but in any event, um, yeah, he he fits the profile of a slot receiver. He certainly performed that way at Florida. Um, fit will matter. You know, you'll, you'll hear me say that a ton because that's really what, what's the biggest thing for me with these guys. But, um, I can see, uh, team taking a chance on him in, in the second round. I can see him being a high volume, uh, reception guy early on, you know, so that will be fun. And then we'll just see, you know, what kind of, uh, what kind of system he operates in, but you know, he could be a, a, a good, Two slash three. I don't think he's a one. I don't think he's a guy who's going to dominate from from an outside perspective. That's just not his game. So you know, in terms of being uh, 
a quality slot receiver. I, I think that's the the type of, you know, we know the fantasy profile, you know, he'll be somebody that will, you know, probably not score a lot of touchdowns, but can still be a, a catch and yards type of guy. Uh, Dave, how about your thoughts on these three? How would you rank Pearsall? I keep putting McConkey last, but I think he's going to be first for most people. So McConkey, Wilson, Pearsall. I can tell you that after the senior bowl, I had Wilson first, Pearsall second, McConkey third, but loved mm -hmm. all three. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that I think Wilson might have the highest ceiling because I think he can be a little bit more than just a slot guy. I think Pearsall and McConkey are are more or less slot guys, but good slot guys, guys that can run routes, get open, great hands, make plays after the catch. Uh, I looked at both Pearsall and McConkey at the Senior Bowl and watched them anytime they had press coverage or physicality in their routes. I thought that they struggled there. But I think there's going to be tons of plays in their careers where they're going to be able to just break away from coverage because their route running is so good and they can catch anything that's within their body's radius, the catch radius, so to speak. Uh, I, I think that they're all going to be able to come in and be very good PPR contributors. Landing spot obviously matters, but I think certainly in the case of McConkey, most likely in the case of Pearsall, and probably in the case of Roman Wilson, they're going to go to teams that are going to say, all right, this is going to be uh, slot players at least for year one, and then we'll see after that. Maybe in the case of McConkey, like it's etched in stone, going to be a slot guy because he can get open so easily. And I look at the teams that are picking in round two. I think you could start right at the top of round two. Carolina could absolutely use another guy that can get open on time for Bryce Young, who apparently is going to move around a lot more this year, get the ball out quicker this year. He's already got two guys that are good at that in Thielen and Deontay Johnson. They can mix and match and put one of these receivers there. New England could certainly use another guy like that. Uh, Washington, short area target to go along with McLaurin and Dotson. Right at the top of round two, it wouldn't surprise me if these guys are going. And probably McConkey will be the one that goes first of this group just because of he's he's ready now as a slot receiver in the NFL. One thing that doesn't get talked about enough with Roman Wilson is that he and I have the same birthday. So I haven't really heard mm. a lot of analysts talk about that, but I did notice that when reviewing his film. Who's uh, a better so route runner, though, you <laughs> or him? <laughs> well, I'd say I'm a better route runner, but he's a little bit more explosive with the 43940. It's slightly better than than what I was able to pull off. Did you, uh, Chris, did you see that on film with Wilson, that speed? I didn't. I, I was no. shocked when I saw what he ran 439 yeah. or 438. Mm -hmm. I was shocked when I saw that. And, and I know he had a good senior bowl, but I, I thought he was all three of these guys. What like I was going to kind of chime in with is that I think they're going to have a lot of like five catch 50 yard games in the NFL where they're just reliable, but they're not really able to stretch defenses vertically, even though they, they did run sub four, four with Wilson. I think he's very reliable, uh, finding the, the void in zone, but no, I did not see that type of speed at Michigan with Roman Wilson. I think that's the floor though. And I, I kind of made that the floor for Josh downs last year. And okay. there were games last year where Josh downs crushed that floor and others were, he was buried under it, but it's it's the same type of thing. Obviously, you want the fit to be perfect, and if, if the fit's good, and you know, we'll be able to see this pretty quickly once they're drafted. We could say, all right, five for fifty. Forget that. We can go six for sixty. We can go six for seventy with some of these guys. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, um, so I want to know how you rank those three: McConkey, Chris, uh, McConkey, Pearsall, and, and Wilson, and. There was another angle, but yeah, I, I guess I look like they, I, they, some of them do make some downfield plays. I mean, you will see that in college, but do these guys have a chance to be more like Tyler Lockett than, you know, Josh, than Pop Douglas or something? But actually, I, I know what my question was. I actually wanted to know if you considered them to be better than, let's say, Jahan Dotson and, and Josh Downs, for example, guys that we've just mentioned recently. You know, are, are McConkey, Wilson, and Pearsall better than them? How do you rank those three? There are a lot of questions there, Chris. So take sure. your time. <laughs> um, so I like McConkey uh, at the top, and then Pearsall, and then Roman Wilson, um, which I think is like the inverse of Dave's rankings. But that's what kind of makes the draft fun. Everyone sees and weighs different things uh, or like weighs things differently. What I think they're different that I, I agree with Dave that they probably all three of them will see the vast majority of their snaps in the slot in the NFL. And that's probably just them being accentuated with space and that, that they can really get open inside. But I feel like with Josh Downs, he was like a different type, even Jahan Dotson, that 
In the slot, he was quicker and more sudden, could run those jerk routes where you fake to the outside and then slam on the brakes and come back inside. McConkey and Pearsall, I think, are a little bit more versatile. Even Roman Wilson, that can play on the perimeter. And I thought on Ricky Pearsall's film and even Lad McConkey, down the field, I don't want to say contested catches where you're thinking that they're dominating like a DK Metcalf or a Mike Evans, but they just track the football very naturally. And for being a, a you know wide receivers that don't have a big catch radius because they have short arms, smaller hands, both of those two at the top, um, they actually came down with a lot of those contested catches. So I, I do think with Josh Downs, he might be a 110 catch type player eventually in the NFL. I don't know if McConkey and Pearsall or Wilson will be that. But I do think they have clearly the speed in terms of the measured speed and just the versatility to be able to play on the perimeter where McConkey actually was primarily used at Georgia. They're not going to be those Cole Beasley underneath type of slot receivers when you get that more with Josh Downs and to a certain degree with Jahan Dotson. Okay. Roman Wilson, by the way, 12 touchdown catches last year for Michigan. That was half of their team's touchdown catches. They threw 24 touchdowns. <laughs> and he had 12 of their catches. And McConkey, yeah. yeah, what I love about him real quick is just thir- like third down and six, that's where they're going. A guy was really clutch, moved the chains, and pleasure to watch him. You're drafting him in every league, are you, because of the birthday thing? Roman Wilson? Yeah. It's weird because I, sometimes I see him talked about as like a round four pick, sometimes as a round two pick. I don't know how people are going to perceive him. And now mm-hmm. he's going to be 23 years old. On the same day that I'll be forty years old, so but um, I would I would guess um, there might be a team that drafts him early, Chargers. Roman Wilson, yeah, could maybe, be. maybe. Let's see, I, a dots for for Roman for these three what guys. If he's the only receiver they draft. <laughs> what will that do to his fantasy just stock? Uh, Ricky Pearsall had an eleven yard a dot. McConkey had a 12.2 yard a dot. Roman Wilson had a 13.9 yard a dot, which is pretty. See, I think they can get down the field a little bit. Yeah. So let's talk about Javon Baker and who any other, anyone else? I think there was someone else we needed to highlight here. Oh, Malik Washington. He's in your top Ooh. 10. Um, yeah. So they are eight and 10. I'll give Chris's top 10 again. Neighbors, Harrison, Brian Thomas, Romo Dunze, Lad McConkey five, then six, seven are the two Texas guys, Worthy and Mitchell. Javon Baker is eight, Troy Franklin nine, Malik Washington ten. So uh, Baker and Washington are pretty different guys, right? What do you think about them? Yeah. I love Javon Baker. I said it kind of at the outset to Jamie that I just think he uh, wins down the football field. The contested catch rate was like fourth or fifth highest in this class among draft eligible wide receivers uh, plays like above the rim, even though he didn't have a crazy vertical, crazy broad jump or anything like that. The flexibility that I was talking about with AD Mitchell, I think he has a fair amount of that, that, that he uses subtleties and can kind of bend his body to get open at the top of the route stem yards after the catch is good. I liked that He started at Alabama and then transferred and then was still really good over the last two years as a big play guy at UCF. Um, and then Malik Washington is a, is a fifth year guy. And I'm usually a little bit lower on the older prospects, but Puka Nakua was relatively old. So was tanked out last year. Um, Malik Washington is to me like what I think is a more functional version of Rondell Moore. He's not quite as fast as Rondell Moore was, but used in that underneath gadget pure slot role at Virginia after being really good at Northwestern for four seasons. And 28% missed tackle force rate, which is one of the highest in the league. Again, Malik Neighbors was 31%. Malik Washington, in the right role, he would certainly need to earn those targets and, and kind of find himself maybe in a Chargers-type situation that needs to fill some targets from last year where you can throw him bubble screens, tunnel screens, name any type of screen. You can get him the ball there. The cutting skill, he had a 42-inch vertical, ran 4-5. And the contact balance, I think, are elite level. So that's why I have... Malik Washington in my top 10. I think he could be that fun, high PPR type guy just because of what he can do creating in space or when there's not a lot of space after the catch. Chris, what does your shirt say? This is my wife's shirt that she made for me last year. It says, don't draft running backs in the first round. (laughs) This is not a a fantasy shirt. This is a just a straight NFL draft shirt. I just thought of the idea last year. She's going to make me a few like, like draft best player available shirt. I have... 
positional value matters. I just like to wear them over the three days of the draft when I'm just doing grades, sitting on my couch, and just want to be as comfortable as possible. I would I would have thought that was like a gift from Pete Prisco. Oh yeah, it it could be. He certainly well, agrees with that. listen to you this year. Definitely not going to get a running back in the first round. <laughs> no. Um, you know, I, I I had you talked about fifth year prospect and and guys. We have a lot of guys that have produced late. You know, yes. um, didn't have a lot of track record. And also, it's so different now. Most of these prospects, I feel like they transferred. You know. And yeah. revival in the COVID and, year just makes a lot of these players COVID. older too, right? So I don't even know how much I should care about that. I, I I don't know. Yeah, I'm sort of ignoring it. I don't know how you're treating it, and I think it comes in play with the quarterbacks as well. Mm-hmm. Almost all of them, right? They transfer. Jane Daniels transfers. Spencer Rattler transfer. Bo Nix transferred and got so much better at their next stop. Michael Penix, right? And some of them are older. So does it matter, Chris? I think it matters a little bit uh, in talking to people at the combine. A few people that I know, like within the league, said that like the league doesn't really care that much. I mean, if it's a Brandon Whedon situation and you're 28, obviously that's different. Uh, but with quarterbacks, and I'll just speak on this quickly. What I actually gathered from the combine, and this is against what I kind of perceive, but that teams actually kind of like the quarterbacks to be older because it probably means that they played more collegiate football and they're just more finished products because. GMs don't have three, four, five years to to watch a quarterback grow. They kind of need that production early on. So for receivers, I think it matters. I don't think the league cares too much. You might maybe see some later guys uh, that are older get picked fifth, sixth, seventh round, but it seems like the league just understands it's a transfer portal era, and obviously everyone got that free year from COVID. I mean, you got to think about it. We went from – it's a five-year window to see how these guys develop to a three-year window to see how these guys develop. So yep. now it's a one-year window. I mean, the Cardinals gave up on Josh Rosen. The Bears have already given up on Justin Fields. I know it was, you know, three years. But, you know, these these teams are moving on very quickly when they realize yep. that, you know, their coaches' jobs are at stake and, and GM's jobs are, are, are quickly getting changed. You know, it's – age doesn't matter if you can play. If you can get s- some success quickly – they're mm-hmm. going to take a chance on it. Now, it's obviously they're going to lean toward younger players if they have the opportunity to, but it's a changing time. You know, it's not yeah, it's not for sure. You don't you don't have the same length of of stay. Not for long is definitely not for long anymore. <laughs> 100%. Well, Chris, thanks for dropping in and really interesting stuff today. You're helping me get ready for the NFL draft. I appreciate you helping all of our viewers and listeners, and we appreciate your time, man. Thank you again. Thanks guys, appreciate it. This Thanks, will not Chris. be the last time we hear from Chris Trapasso. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you. You're, you're very welcome. Thank you, Dave. Ah! <laughs> All right, everybody. Have an awesome weekend. We'll talk to you on Monday with a fresh edition, a spinly edition of Fantasy Football Today.